This is a, a great delight to be here. Um, I have family roots in, in Plymouth. My, uh, my father was born here and still an extended family who basically spent most of their life working in, in the dockyard, which were decreasingly few in number, of course, managed to do. Um, so I do have some sense of the southwest, although I've spent the last 40 years living in London and, and a few other cities of the world. Um, and I'm absolutely delighted to um, be here to talk to you about um, why HS2 will be good for the southwest. Although I have to confess a sinking feeling when I finally realized a couple of weeks ago that actually was the title of this talk. How the hell did I agree that? It's that very, very um, effective persuader, John, uh, persuaded me that would be a good subject. So I had a bit of a sinking feeling, partly because events since I agreed to speak on that topic have not actually helped my case very much. Um, but despite that, um, I do believe that HS2 already has been good for the Southwest, which you'll probably find hard to believe, uh, and will in the end be good for the Southwest too. But there are certainly some big challenges on the way. So what I'm going to do is spend the first part of this talk, uh, as it were, uh, addressing that subject and uh, doing my best to convince you. I'm going to, I'm going to assume you're all doubters of this proposition because I, I've never met anybody who, given that, will say, yeah, of course. Um, so you're all doubters, and if I persuade two of you, I shall feel it's a great achievement. Um, and we can obviously discuss the ins and outs of that. That's the first part of what I want to talk about. The second part, really, is to just look more broadly at the, the Southwest and its rail proposition going forward, because this is, in my view, a very, very interesting time in this part of the country, as well as, I have to say, in some other parts, in terms of rail. We're in a, a very unusual position, I think, uh, and one that could be thrown away and wasted, or one that could be seized and developed um, really productively. So, in two parts. So, let's, uh, let's get to the chase. There are three reasons, I think, why HS2 will be good for the Southwest. And the first, uh, is that HS2 is a part of the overall upturn in commitment to developing the national rail network. And it's basically created the very peculiar position that politically it's very difficult for ministers to turn around and say, well, we're investing in HS2 and you all know what that means. But these other parts of the country... Um, we're not. And indeed, I would contend that basically, since HS2 was announced, started really in political terms, 2009, uh, Root announced just before the election of 2010, so five years ago. Since then, ministers, as my observation, is they've approved virtually every developed rail investment proposition that's come along. And indeed, as we've discovered, they've probably approved too much, in fact. So that's the politics of it. They're committed to HS2, and somebody says, yeah, but what about us? Really, the answer for ministers is, well, what do you want? What do you need? Yeah, and the investment has followed. So I, I do think that while HS2 doesn't serve the Southwest anywhere near directly, it has had that effect and it would be, uh, I think it's quite hard to deny that. Um, and it's worth just asking yourself the question, well, supposing we got rid of HS2, what would happen? Well, the answer is that the corridors it serves, and in particular the West Coast Main Line, is pretty full. The, the terminus station at Euston is bursting at the seams and needs to be rebuilt anyway, which is kind of something that kind of gets overlooked by people who say, oh, let's not bother with HS2, let's just upgrade the existing line, and they have kind of fanciful ideas about how that might happen, some not so fanciful, but they all tend to overlook this huge problem, all this stuff from these 
cities and the West Coast ends up in Euston and it is bursting at the seams. So my point is even without HS2 you wouldn't avoid spending money in that corridor and quite significant money. The second reason is jobs and I have some evidence on this that I'll show you. Major rail investment projects in the UK generate jobs right across the country. You probably think, oh, I can think of some big projects. I'll, I'll tell you one, Crossrail, 15 billion quid. You probably think that's money spent in London for the benefit of London. Well, it isn't uh, entirely that and I'll show you some of the evidence on it. So jobs do come up from these major investments right across the country. And the third argument, and I'd have put this first were it not for the difficulty uh, I have, which is over the last six months this has got a harder argument to support, is actually off the back of HS2 there will be connectivity gains for the southwest as well as for other parts of the country. And I'll explain why that's now a bit of a tougher tougher ask, as it were. So, as I say, since HS2 came along, ministers have approved virtually every rail project going. Um, the images of Reading Station, I mean, it's extraordinary investment. Um, Birmingham New Street, another extraordinary investment. And some of these do actually help the South West. They're not in the southwest, so you might say, "Well, that's that's not what we want." I can tell you, the southwest is still going to gain from sorting out Reading Station. Um, uh, this is not finally committed, but I think there's a very, very good chance it's going to happen. It's under uh, advanced development. A direct rail access from the west into Heathrow Airport. I remember reading uh, a, a debate in, uh, in in this part of the world years back, well, which is our local airport, you know, Exeter or Plymouth? Uh, no, your local airport's Heathrow, somebody here said. Um, well, um, that would be fantastic. The electrification plan, yes, you'll say, but it doesn't come very close. Well, it doesn't, but it is a start on electrifying the route from uh, the, the, the west of England to London. Uh, and Crossrail itself, you say, well, what good's that? Well, I'll tell you what good that is. It overcomes the problem Paddington's had for years, which is you get there and then you want to get somewhere else and it ain't too clever. Crossrail will transform the connections onwards from Paddington. The IEP prog uh, program, the in Intercity Express program, now uh, taking expression, trains are being built by Hitachi. Um, will serve as we'll come on to talk about the southwest and of course there are local schemes as well they're not on the, the scale of these things but they do exist and they're promoted locally and so on this is a huge rail capital program and you know there's all this other stuff you know electrifying the middle of a line across the pennines all that kind of thing going on as well it's a huge program these have, and, and I believe HS2 will bring the next point jobs um, to the southwest. Let me give you an example. This is, this is a slide that Crossrail produced, an image they produced a couple of years back, showing where their suppliers are. 15 billion pound program. There are a lot of businesses involved in producing things for it. Now, there's not a huge number in the southwest, just like there's not a huge number in, uh, say, Cumbria or Wales. But there are some. Um, and I'll pick out one that's highlighted as it happens on this map, which is a company based in Oakhampton. It's got a contract off the back of Crossrail. You know, these big spend projects do end up creating workload and jobs. So uh, I'll give you an, another example. I can't, I can't tell you this for HS2 yet, of course, because although the Chancellor rather oddly chose to announce this in China, uh, there is a £13 billion procurement uh, just about to get underway on HS2. But of course, we don't know who's got the, pro the project. And the big companies will 
uh, subcontract a lot of that. But this is Hitachi. On the face of it, this is uh, a train project. Some of the uh, early trains were built in Japan, then most of them will be built in County Durham. They have a huge supply chain. I mean, this is the way of the world these days. And listed around these, I apologize if you can't read any of these, but um, a couple of these are in, in the Southwest. Um, the braking system's built by a company based in Melksham. The flooring comes from a company in Liscard. I, I, I mean, I always find it exciting when you discover there are these local businesses that are, I mean, if they've won this contract, they're the best place company to supply this part of the kit. So don't assume that there's nothing in it for the Southwest out of these things. Um, but, you know, we, we, we wait to see how HS2 will pan out, and I think there will be uh, a very similar pattern of a very widespread across the UK. Um, certainly the uh, people in HS2 Limited are very keen on that, and if you're worried about, and I made the reference to the Chinese uh, l link that the Chancellor's very keen on pursuing, well, Simon Kirby, who heads HS2 Limited, made very clear last week, HS2 Limited is about jobs in the UK. We can't import a Chinese workforce, even in part, to do this. And, uh, so, so that's the nature of the beast. So that's something about the strength of the investment programme in rail, which I think HS2 has acted as some kind of uh, in a, a lead role for, and the, uh, and the reality around jobs. Now, what about this connectivity point? Well, um, the first obvious proposition about HS2 for the South West is that it could be, it isn't yet, but it could be an X-shaped network across the heart of the country. This is uh, uh, rather than what it's generally advertised as being, which is a Y-shaped network. So in this diagram, the dark blue is the first phase of HS2. It goes roughly London, West Midlands. The ordinary middle blue are the two limbs going northwards, one to Manchester and the other to Leeds. And indeed, they have connections onwards. So it even, the services on HS2 will serve Scotland and Liverpool and other places that are just beyond the new infrastructure. This diagram is actually taken from a Department for Transport document released uh, almost exactly two years ago, which was an updated case for HS2. And there's a grey line, and the grey line goes from Birmingham to Bristol and Cardiff. And the proposition is, and this was the department's view at the time, but oh, these are the services that could run over HS2. Now, I say at the time because nothing has yet been developed to make that possible. There is no planned connection at Birmingham to connect HS2 limbs going northwards into the existing network that would make that kind of proposition uh, feasible. But it could be added, and in my view, would make a great deal more sense of the investment being made in the Y-shaped network um, if it actually did become an X-shaped network. Because, candidly, the big weakness of Y-shaped networks is they're not very efficient. And those of you who can start thinking in Kirchhoff's laws of electricity flow or something, you know, it just doesn't balance. You're going to have a very, very busy stem and two less busy limbs into it. Well, it doesn't make much sense. An X-shaped network would be much better off. I remember talking to Chris Green about this it, way before HS2 Limited started, and we were sort of doodling around what high-speed rail in Britain might look like, and he said, well, it needs to be in. Yeah, well, he was right, and he's a, a, a very wise character. So um, I think that's one of the possibilities. Um, but you do have this problem. It takes half a day to get from Plymouth to Birmingham, um, which, is, which is none too clever. So it's not just a matter of a physical connection at Birmingham. I mean, really, to get value out of this and persuade people it's sensible to use train, I don't know, you get from, say, Plymouth to Manchester or Leeds, rather than, I, I don't know, what do people do? Go to Exeter and catch a flight if they need to be there, talk quickly, or flog up the motorway. 
um, that journey needs to be speeded up, that's for sure. But that, I do think, remains one of the ways in which the Southwest could benefit once you get into the second phase of HS2. The second way is really a bit of a complex story, and I'm sorry it's going to take me a little while to explain this. This is an image of what Green Gage developed as a national rail network, and it was developed um, before HS2 published their plans. It was based on a proposition that we'd advanced in 2007, which is, well, when HS1 is finished, Channel Tunnel Rail Link, uh, which at that stage it hadn't been, the answer to the question, well, what next, ought to be something that we happily called HS2. Uh, and it was basically the red line up to the West Midlands, which is exactly what government did. And I, I mean, candidly, uh, Lord Adonis, who was the, the kind of min key minister at the time, I mean, he picked up a wadge of reports we'd written in Green Gage and said, we'll have some of that, thanks very much. And his remit was basically bought the argument that we'd gone through, which is this w really was the critical corridor to look at. But we did look at the whole question of a national network and came to the view that you needed, in the long term, I mean, this is real kind of blue sky thinking, you need two north-south routes and three east-west routes, and they may have rather different characteristics. But the most important point is, in the southeast of England, in a way analogous to the National Motorway Network, you've got to think about the interconnections. If you ask SNCF about this, what did you really not get quite right with the TGV network, which, just to remind you, started in 1982 with a segment of the route between Paris and Lyon. And they say two things. Um, one, we didn't really ever recognize how much capacity we were going to need to provide on this system. And it would have been handier if we... I mean, it, they're, they're harsh critics because they were clever enough to think of what at the time seemed a very wild proposition. We, well, we'll build our high-speed trains a little bit of French here, and you know what we're going to do? When the trains fill, we'll make them double-deck high-speed trains. I mean, I remember people saying, well, how can you have that, you know? The image of a double-decker bus kind of thing. Well, they did it, and they designed it for that. Uh, and of course, they've used it. It gives them 40% more capacity than you get out of a single-deck train. So that's a little bit harsh. But the other thing they say, the other thing they come out with as to what they should have thought about harder was how you interconnect the network around Paris. And in truth, it's partly been achieved, but it ain't been fully achieved. And it's a weakness in the system. And it's a particular weakness because what they have discovered is you can run high-speed trains from relatively small provincial centres like Nantes in the west to Marseille a little bit bigger in the south as a direct train. It will tend to go across to Paris and down to Marseille. That doesn't matter. It doesn't, it's not serving the Paris market. It's linking two regions of France. And they can sell those trains, the seats, the capacity, and they're viable just in the way that trains to and from Paris are. So you have to think about um, the the, the other connections. And um, I'm afraid, crudely, I don't think HS2 Limited have grasped this point. Uh, so they're pretty focused on getting people in and out of Euston. Of course, central London's kind of, is big and it's, you might think, ugly, <laughs> but it's a strong market. You can be pretty sure that's where people want to go to and from. When we looked at this, and I have to say, the work that underpinned all this st stuff about routes and networks and so on was uh, supported by a huge number of bodies. The regional, every English regional development agency co-funded this work, a number of city councils, Transport for London, Network Rail. And we concluded, and this is a very simplified map of the geography of railways, so if any of you have worked out the Heathrow's south of the Great Western Minute, yeah, fantastic. This is just designed to show the linkages, all right? So no cleverness here, chaps. This is just kind of what we reckoned 
might make sense longer term as a high-speed rail network gets developed. And what it provides for the west and the southwest of the country is a route into Heathrow, possibly a route into the centre of London, but out of that connectivity into everything else. Um, it's a kind of, I mean, the, the east-west route is, of course, in the middle of London, but it's sort of a bit like, I guess, analogous to the M25. And HS2 Limited, bless them, did look at and had in their plans until earlier this year a link from HS2, linked both north and to the east, down to Heathrow Airport. They had a pretty good design as well for a station at Heathrow Airport, which unlike most attempts to get stations near airports, think Birmingham and Manchester HS2 Limited, neither of which are close enough to the airport, is right next to Terminal 5, and they got a design that I think would have been particularly effective. But it's since been dropped uh, during the course of this year as, well, we're not going to proceed with that now. Also dropped is a connection between HS1 and HS2, which is the, the horizontal green line in there. Well, in truth, it's still out for study. So the idea that you can connect into the southern end of this route is reduced to, well, we've got Old Oak Common and you can change there. I don't quite see how that's going to benefit the southwest of England, it might benefit the Thames Valley. Um, I think this is not a battle uh, to give up on because I just think it's so important to get this stuff right. And indeed, cities in the Midlands, the North and Scotland and Transport for London are going to petition the bill and say you've got to put in an HS1, HS2 link. Um, so that will be something interesting to watch. And even if that original concept disappears, if you start looking at the services that run on HS1, and there are two kinds of services, one is international services at the moment to Paris, Brussels and so on, but soon also to Amsterdam and a little bit later also to Germany and so on. Um, if you look at the analysis of which markets beyond central London those trains could serve profitably, because they're kind of commercial enterprises, these things? The answer, and there's a lot of dismay anywhere outside the southeast when uh, you hear this, the best proposition is Heathrow. That's what Eurostar have concluded, uh, and I don't think they're wrong. Um, well, if Heathrow is also linked to the west of England, you don't need a high-speed railway to do that, you just need a western rail access, that would be pretty damn good. I know everybody says, I'd like to be able to get on a train at, you know, Newton Abbott or somewhere and get off it at Paris. Uh, I would say get real. Um, get real because the people running a service from London or Heathrow are going to be providing many more trains than you're ever going to get running from the West Country or indeed the North of England direct to Europe. Create, on the other hand, a really good immediate and direct interchange and I think you get the a lot of the accessibility gain out of the European high-speed network. So the HS1, HS2 link I think could be still a way in which the southwest could benefit. But as I admit the connectivity argument is difficult given the lack of commitment to these onward connections at the moment uh, and it, it's something that you know, the southwest wouldn't be the only region in the UK saying, well, this isn't quite what we need. We need, we need better than this. But just to sum it up, those are my three arguments. Why, well, thank you, John. <laughs> why I believe HS2 <laughs> is good for the southwest. And I do think they are, you know, well, at least we can have an argument about them, can't we? Um, I do think there has been a commitment to rail investment off the back of HS2. I do think these major rail projects, including HS2, will bring a spread of jobs across the country. And subject to these uncertainties, I think there is a, a key connectivity point. 
Um, well, uh, I don't know. I'll rest my case at that point and look forward to your barrage of abuse at the end. Oh, no, it's not like that at all. And I move on to part two, which is kind of, I've given their heading, well, what next, really? Whatever next. And there are really three things I want to cover. Uh, I'm afraid I drift back into talking about high-speed rail in this. But first of all, I want to talk about, well, what really lies in store? I made that claim at the beginning that actually this is a very exciting period. So what have you got to fight for? Um, CP5 and CP6, the railway regulated industry, or at least network rail is, um, control period five and control period six. 2014 to 2019, 2019 to 2024. It's the way the railway thinks about its plans. The current period, five-year plan, is kind of fixed but slipping. The next five-year plan, we, we've become very kind of um, sort of Soviet about five-year plans in the railway industry. We, we don't seem to mind that. Um, the five to ten-year period is up for grabs. Um, yeah, we'll see that image again. And then I want to just touch on this question of what drives the case for high-speed rail, because I do think journey times and connectivity for the southwest is a key issue. I'll talk about the evidence on that. Um, uh, and then come back to this question, well, if you, if you think there's something in this, um, how can the southwest really get um, its share of, of the the cake. But this first question is really very fascinating. Um, what, what can you expect by 2019, 2024, so over the next few years? I mean, everything in railways takes forever. You know, 2024 to me is like tomorrow. You may think it's a long way away. I spend my life thinking about what's going to happen in the 2030s, so I'm just peculiar like that. Uh, and soon it'll be the 2040s. Um, right, so, well, um, this new train um, is going to appear. In fact, you are, I, I think you really are, I just have to observe, very fortunate in that the current franchise holder, I think, has sort of got itself pretty embedded in understanding what stakeholder views are in the Southwest and realised in looking for an extension of its franchise, which was kind of uh, basically because the department couldn't let all the franchises at the same time, that it needed to make some commitment to improving services, and it has. We'll talk about some of these in, in detail in a moment. Um, the second interesting question is whether there could be um, a Devon and Cornwall franchise, and what would that mean? Something that the Chancellor has floated. Here's another thing. What about reopening a railway line which would create a second route between this city and uh, the rest of the country? Happens to be something that Green Gage studied earlier this year. Uh, can you expect further? Yes, I think you can expect further improvements to local services. Um, you can tell me whether you like those kind of trains or not. They hate them in the north, but you've got bet better versions down here. Um, uh, and you, you're fortunate in having um, some local authorities are very supportive of developing and improving local services. Um, what you also would observe, though, just thinking about the national picture, rail freight has not been very successful. It's been receding in the southwest. Um, so can that be turned around? And the image there is, though it looks like a kind of west, west of England viaduct, it isn't. It's somewhere in um, Scotland. And this is a, uh, a train of really the retail distribution industry going northwards from central belt of Scotland to Inverness. And you kind of think, well, why isn't the same thing happening in the west of England? All right, so um, let's look at some of those things. Um, 
And what about this new fleet of trains? Well, this is a train which, at least in theory, I mean, it, its design platform is designed to give you a 140 mile an hour train. I think going to be doing that, uh, uh, I can tell you, uh, on the existing infrastructure. But it's worth just noting what this commitment is. And this is now funded, I think I'm correct in saying. There was a period where, well, this was a proposition. I thought, well, that's very nice, but the department hadn't committed to it. Um, these are trains which will be bought by the franchisee. Uh, so unlike the, the Intercity Express program project, which is a, kind, is a, it's a private finance project, that's why people in the rail industry get very excited about how expensive it is. But what you're really doing is paying for the financing of those trains on a very long-term uh, <coughs> maintenance and availability contract. But these trains will be bought. Um, and it's important that the department stands behind that because they're going to be very, the costs of these are going to pass on into successor franchises. So. It's, it is an important commitment. It's a very big train order. It does seem to me to be, at least, exactly the kind of train fleet you would need. Um, there's always arguments about how many seats and how much space you put in them and all that kind of stuff. I think there is one worrying factor, which is I think there are implications in this city because these trains, I don't think, are going to get maintained in the way that the current HST fleet is maintained out of their depot. And that's a function of the fact that the IEP fleet uh, has a new depot being built at Bristol and a second depot uh, in London. So that is an issue, and it's a not insignificant one. Um, franchising, I think, was the next thing on that list. This is the rail executive at the Department for Transport's um, franchising program. I'm sorry, this is going to test your eyesight as well. There's not much I can do about that. But third from the bottom is Great Western. Uh, second from the bottom is Cross Country. Oh, I can't quite reach them. Um, the Great Western franchise is, gets this little extension contract and then it will be competitively tendered again. The Labour Party would like to maybe have it back, but they're not in government. The Conservative Party will, the government will certainly retender that starting in 2017 with a new franchise being awarded in 2019. Uh, Southwest Trains, which is relevant at least to Exeter, is kind of halfway down the page and it's about to start the process of a competitive rebid. What about this Devon and Cornwall franchise idea? Um, I mean, where did it come from? Um, I mean, I just read about it in the paper. Oh, what about a Devon and Cornwall franchise? Interesting. And there'll be lots of different views about it. Um, <laughs> You know, that's not the whole list of franchises. There are 17 franchises in the UK at the moment. Um, when I got to the SRA, there were 26, and we were rather keen to piece them together. Uh, the, the view at the time was less fragmentation would be a good thing, fewer interfaces. Uh, there are some reasons to believe that, uh, well, maybe going forward, they've got too big. Great Western, it's, it's now called Great Western Railway, isn't it? Not first Great Western. I mean, it has earnings of around a billion pounds per annum. If you're faced with the challenge of being government, say, I'm going to invite you to bid for something that you will earn a billion quid per annum, you're going to want some kind of confidence. These people aren't going to run away with the money. You're going to want a big down payment. The scale of those down payments East Coast was the last one to be let, are getting big. A quarter of a billion. That's the kind of, well, that's, 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 you can have that if I run away kind of thing. Uh, there are very, very few businesses that can uh, face that kind of thing. And if you can't get competitive bids, you're in a very weak position letting these franchises. 
You're all going to think like civil servants soon. Go away and worry about this. How do you let something that big? Well, one of the answers is you don't let something that big. You split it down. Would it make sense to extract a Devon and Cornwall franchise in effect from Great Western, although it might be cross-country or whatever? Well, a big problem with that seems to me to be, although you could exercise some con better control over local rail services, you know, running up and down the main line and on the branches, that fundamental problem, if you happen to be somebody who lives in Falmouth rather than Truro, is you've now got two railway companies potentially providing your link to Bristol, London, everywhere else. And that doesn't seem to me to be too clever. So it, my personal view is there may be some value in this, because I think people, the evidence suggests, prefer locally managed franchises. The investment in Great Western is all going to be focused on the London, Bristol, South Wales corridor in terms of electrification, aside from Newbury. But I would kind of think I'd want the route to Paddington to be in that franchise as well. That's my personal view, if that's the way it's going to go. So it would be all of the Devon and Cornwall routes plus the route to, to London. And I think that could be a franchise that would have a great deal of attraction. But who knows? Um, th this this is, has not emerged yet. You know, No doubt there are very clever people in the Department of Transport thinking about these issues. How do they want to progress it? They haven't got long in railway terms to think about it because 2017, they've got to issue a specification for what they want. But it's an interesting thought. Um, as is the next question, well, you know, we, everybody knows about the seawall at Dawlish and what happened a couple of years ago and the question of resilience to the southwest. And while there are a number of options that have been looked at, the option that seems, <coughs> seemed to us earlier this year really ought to be thought about a little bit more is the idea of recreating a, a northern route around Dartmoor. Um, actually, it wouldn't mean that much longer journey time between Plymouth and Exeter. Not so clever if that's your alternative route and Dawlish is knocked out again. If you're in Tor Bay, I would accept. But if you're in Cornwall or Plymouth, really, it is a genuine potential second route. So I just want to spend a couple of minutes mentioning some work that Network Rail did on that and then some work that Greengage did on it earlier this year. Um, we thought we'd, we'd do some research and we were delighted to find, thanks John for pointing me towards this, one of your students had just done some research on this and had looked at one of the very questions we wanted to know, which is, well, what are people in Tavistock and Oakhampton, which is the two key places that would have a rail service that don't have one today, what do they think about it? What do they think about the idea of a rail service? There's some very famous research done by uh, people back in 198, uh, the early 80s, 80, 81, on, it was called the social consequences of rail closures. And actually, uh, they did a dozen or so case studies, and one of them was Oakhampton. So they went back a few years after Oakhampton had finally lost its rail service and said, well, well, what difference has it made? And they found all kinds of interesting things, like people were travelling less. People were, those that were, were finding their journeys were a lot harder. They were the kind of things that you would expect. Well... The interesting question to me is, well, what are people going to think about it if, you, if they then get a rail service? They've not had one for, how long is it, 40, 40 years, 50 years? Uh, and so this piece of research, which was very thorough, I have to commend, um, this is student dissertations. I mean, they've gone up in standards since my day. I mean, proper samples, good rigour, questionnaires. Um, this person followed up on a household survey delivered to over 30 
75% of the households in Tavistock. So <coughs> as good a survey as you're likely to get. And I'm not going to go into all the detail of what it showed, but it does show a lot of things. It shows what people in Tavistock think about having a rail service. A clear majority of them think it would be fantastic. Oh, yeah, great. It's actually quite a few, only 20%, don't really want it. If you look at that top graph, no, not really, or no, not at all, adds up to about 20%. And what um, Isabel Coombs was interested in was the relationship between this rail link and housing development. Because the idea of a rail extension up from, uh, well, it's Beer, Beer Austin, really, isn't it, uh, to Tavistock, has been linked to the idea of a major expansion of housing in Tavistock. And so I think some of this, looking at this research result, is actually about, well, I wouldn't mind a rail link, I'm not sure I want the housing. And I'm afraid it's a characteristic of just about everywhere that they don't want that stuff. And talking to people in, 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 the, in both uh, Tavistock and Oakhampton, you know, they're very alive to the development pressures. They're very alive to the fact that if there is more housing, the services they have, the schools, the hospitals, the roads, bus services, their kind of presumption is they're going to be put under greater pressure. So if the rail link is seen as being the means to expedite that, you'll get some resistance. It's not enough on balance, certainly at the moment, to say people would rather not have it, thanks very much. And to me, in thinking about the potential sustainable development of West Devon, North West Devon, you know, North, North Cornwall, you know, the places to put any housing growth are in the existing towns. They're not to permit the sort of random development that will um, damage and destroy the area. The second point I just want to make about looking at this, this is uh, two railways actually, um, uh, in, in X railways in that photograph, um, on the west side of Dartmoor. Oh, why bother with one? You'd have two, you know, the competing ways in which our national rail system would develop. Obviously a big market up at Lidford. Um, so um, how, how easy is it to reinstate a railway there? This is long gone. Uh, people rather enjoy the peace and quiet, no doubt. Well, these are some of the things that actually make it a much more expensive proposition than you might think. Um, the railways that were built in the olden days were built without a very good knowledge of soil mechanics, crudely. Um, you'll find a railway reinstatement. There's a lot of investment. You think of the, the Borders Railway uh, just reopened in drainage. Uh, and uh, I'm, I think actually the, the earthworks were quite good. But in a lot of places, they're not. And the evidence of that is the number of parts of the National Rail Network that after the flood damage of a couple of years ago, heavy rainfall, earthworks slipped. You can't go about reopening a railway without making sure that's not going to happen. Um, you could take an extreme view, and I'm afraid I think Network Rail did take an extreme view, because when they looked at this, they kind of concluded you'd have to build the track bed, at least in some parts of the route, much higher than it. It, it was built in the first place, I mean elevation, and I'm talking several metres, and that's you know, going to be a very expensive solution. Then you've got to think about crossings. When these railways were built, level crossings, what's the worry? Accommodation crossings, fine. The trains are not particularly quick, and we had a different view about rail safety to what we have these days. You may think a privatised railway is a pretty crazy idea, and many of us did, but it now has basically the best rail safety record for passengers in Europe. It's worth remembering that. So you're going to be into bridge works where in the past simple, much cheaper crossings were sufficient. And then you'll get into, well, hang on, I don't want a platform and a train that's actually difficult to get on and off. Um, and I'm not going to 
accept a station that requires stepped access. Uh, and by the way, the way in which you signalled railways in the past, which was pretty cheap to put in, expensive to run, but cheap to put in, you can forget that as well. So it's, it's not simply, can I please have what I once had and Dr. Beeching or somebody rather unkindly took away. Building a railway, even if there's an alignment there, is quite a challenging piece of engineering. Um, but I have to say, the way in which Network Rail have looked at this, uh, I think it was a bit over the top. They estimated the cost at somewhere around £800 million to rebuild this sort of missing railway. Uh, I don't have a better estimate, but I would be astonished if that couldn't be reduced by 20 or 25 percent. And I say that because of the, the assumption that this would be designed to accommodate 125 mile an hour trains, which is actually going to be pretty impossible over most of it. Um, uh, and um, as I say, uh, I think a slightly extreme view on uh, uh, addressing the flood risk issue. Um, and a presumption there's got to be a two-track railway. Now, everybody would rather have a two-track railway than a one-track railway cars that you get more capacity out of them, but you've got to ask yourself, do you really need it? The Borders Railway, that is a contentious issue, but it's basically been built as a single-track railway. It's worth being realistic about these things. The benefits, I think, are huge from reopening a second line. And the first key benefit is the resilience to the Southwest economy if you're not dependent on one line, which, <coughs> sorry guys, I hate to tell you this, what happened at the sea over topping at Dawlish is expected to happen again. The projections are, of course nobody knows when, the projections are, it'll happen once every 10 years, there will be a severe problem there Network Rail took the view closing the railway for maybe six weeks. I mean, that's a pretty hopeless railway. Nowhere else in the country, possible exception of North Wales, really is this prone to impact from weather and sea and so on. Um, so th this is important. And, it, you know, the... <laughs> The way this has been evaluated in looking at the case for investing so far is unbelievably narrow because the rail industry has looked at this and said, oh, well, if every 10 years we can't run a train service, infrastructure owner mindset, I'll have to compensate the train operating companies. That's the disruption cost. Well, you will know that the disruption cost, I mean, that's all very interesting, but this is like people playing with wooden dollars. The real impact is if the southwest economy is cut off, if the tourism industry is perceived to be, as for some reason it was, well, you know, I'll tell you the reason why it was. If you get those images of the sea coming over at Dawlish, people think, well, cri crikey, I don't think I can get to those nice bits of Devon and Cornwall anymore. Of course you could, but they didn't think you could. So that is a hugely important factor. Um, the second thing is the area we looked at in our research, and incidentally, this is all published on the Green Gauge 21 website, and all, these, all the work we do is published and freely available. Um, we think it will strengthen the economies of Tavistock and Oakhampton in particular, and it will support sustainable development, and it will help the economies of both Plymouth and Exeter too will do that because it basically widens employee uh, journey to work areas. I mean, if you've got a congested road network and they tend to get worse over time and the A386 is a bit, bit full already, um, having a rail alternative will make a difference. <coughs> Uh, I just always have to talk about the dockyard because I told you about that at the beginning. <laughs> um, but if you really want to develop the naval dockyard in Plymouth, and I'm not sure the government does, um, you want to be able to get material in and out. And I think the importance and significance for rail freight is this. <coughs> if you look at investment in 
gauge clearance to accommodate ever bigger containers in and out of our major ports, you'll find that what the rail freight operators say, well, that's fantastic, you know, let's gauge clear whatever route it is, Southampton, Felixstowe, whatever. Right, what's the diversionary route available to me if there's anything wrong with that one? And unless you can tell me there's a gauge clear diversionary route, I feel quite nervous about that proposition. So you'll never get investment, in my view, in commitment to rail freight <coughs> development in the southwest unless you can better present options for uh, overcoming uh, resilience uh, when, when there's disruption. But the key difference that we <laughs> concluded in our green gauge work was you've got to assume that, of course, you'll provide a train service over this new line. And you think, well, obviously, what do you build a railway for? You to run a service. The network rail analysis, I have to say, did not assume there was any local train service provided over it. The only benefits in terms of train service that were looked at was the benefit every 10 years of running a high-speed train, or HST, um, from Plymouth on a different route to Exeter for six weeks. Unsurprisingly, the benefit-cost ratio was remarkably small. <laughs> we think that, and so do a number of other people, you could run a pretty useful service from Plymouth to Tavistock to Oakhampton. There may be some other stations that you need to think about. And in our view, just thinking about the operational efficiency of this, you could run those as an extension of the Southwest train service out of Exeter. And you might think that's a bit fanciful. But here's another interesting thing. The difference in revenue from a station in a relatively remote part of Britain that has a connection to London compared with one that's got a similar frequency of train service, say every hour, but doesn't have a through train to London, is the revenue doubles. London earns money for railway companies like nowhere else. You may think London's too dominant in the economy, but I'm sorry, the commercial reality of rail, it's, it's where the money is. Right. So we talked about what lies in store, and we'll come back to some of this at, at the end shortly. Uh, what drives the case for high-speed rail? How are we doing on time? We're going to speed up a bit, I think. <sighs> high-speed, high-speed rail. <laughs> Um, there's some reality about high-speed rail. You need strong demand corridors, and actually the case for investing in high-speed rail is in general about capacity. I know people say, oh, but high-speed rail is about saving 20 minutes between London and Birmingham. That 10 or 10 minutes, actually, these are people who think HS2 is a waste of time. They say, what's the point of that? Well, I tend to agree. What is the point of that? You know, um, as Bill Bryson says, you can have a cup of coffee if you save 10 minutes on the train journey. That's what people will do. The reason for looking at uh, high-speed rail is because you have a capacity problem. It's also rail the most sustainable mode, and it may give you some connectivity gains. The evidence is it probably will give you some benefit in regional e economies, as well as benefits to the central economy, which in the UK terms is London, of course. But, you know, it doesn't happen by magic. I mean, other things ha have to happen. Markets have to respond. Markets have to say, you know what? I think I could locate my business there. I didn't think of that before, but I see it's really well interconnected, this place. I think I'm going to make a visit there because I can get there and back in a day and all those kind of things. The market has to respond in all kinds of ways and um, public policy uh, is a factor there. Just going back to HS2, and I'm going to come back to the southwest in a minute. HS2 has these characteristics. And I want you to look at these and think, mm, does the southwest have some of these? And you'll probably get some, a sinking feeling, but then, you know, it's not that bad. HS2 links eight out of the ten biggest cities in the UK when it's developed. Fantastic, we certainly can't match that. It's a mixed traffic railway. That's 
an image of one of the, the really critical and awkward junctions on the West Coast Main Line. It's College, just south of Stafford. 125 mile an hour tilting train and a 75 mile an hour freight don't mix very well. Eat route capacity. It serves a very busy corridor. Euston's the fastest growing terminus in London. There aren't any more train paths available. I mean, there were a couple of years ago, but they've been taken up. Uh, and by the way, the trains are running at maximum length. Not all of them, but the ones in the peak of the peak are. So the Pendolinos, which were initially seven, eight cars, then became nine, they're 11 cars long. The commuter trains were eight cars long, they're now 12 cars long. Uh, is that the position going into Paddington? Because these, you know, this is where these routes are at the busiest as they get into the busier part of the country. Uh, punctuality on the West Coast is significantly below par, both for the commuter operator and the intercity operator. It's a sign of how intensively used the route is. The parallel motorways are pretty good. Well, they got motorways. <laughs> that was unfair, wasn't it? You have the A303 and the A38 and the rest of it. Well, yeah, OK. Um, there are significant domestic airflows in the HS2 corridor, at least between uh, London and Scotland. So if you build HS2, you can argue about the time savings and all the rest of it, but it's pretty indisputable. It solves a palpable capacity problem. Um, and as I say, I think there is evidence that it helps address one of the government's other kind of problems. So with that in mind, to what extent could you argue successfully for an equivalent investment, which might not be a brand new high speed line for the southwest? So let's end up by looking at that. And here's the contention that I think you have to worry about. If HS2 is built and all the services run, there is no other major English city that is more than two hours from London. And Plymouth is currently three. So if you're choosing where to put your business, I'm afraid Plymouth does not register. Although, just looking at it, what a fantastic place. So, you know, uh, it would be great to overcome this. Um, well, you've got a rail task force that's doing good things and pushing for the capacity, reliability, resilience and journey time arguments. But here's a thing. Look at the devolution bill being pushed through. And when you think of devolution, you think of Manchester and these amazing things they, they've pulled off there. You might have heard of transport for the north. Well, the devolution bill, last time I looked, has a generic clause in to allow the creation of sub-national transport authorities. You could have transport for the southwest off the back of that bill, which would be local authorities coming together and saying, we want to take responsibility for, guess what? Rail franchises, rail service development, investment, highways too. That's what the North is doing. Why shouldn't the Southwest? And, you know, these are ways to get leverage with government. I think the third thing that can be done is to consider the capacity case and the fourth is to look at the connectivity. So very quickly on that, the capacity case, is it the same as into Euston? Well, I've got to say, it's not good. The Reading, sorry, the case is good, the route isn't, I should be clearer. The capacity position isn't good. It is an extremely busy route with extremely busy trains. Um, now, you, it, I may seem more remote from you, but this is part of making the case for investment. And the traffic mix is a problem too. I only passed three loaded aggregates trains on my journey down the Barks and Hans line this afternoon, but they're there and they don't travel at the same speed as the train I was on going the opposite direction. 
they use up rail capacity. Um, the Great Western Railway service uplift, which is going to increase frequency, um, is going to impact on demand. I'm sure it will succeed. All the evidence from everywhere else is it will generate more demand. And so the position will be one of increasing utilisation, increasing demand. You've got to look at this not just as a rail problem. And you are committed in the southwest to some quite chunky investment, some might say at last, on the long distance road network. Um, well, you've got to ask what impact that's going to have. Um, I think all the evidence is in the longer run, um, not as much as people think desirable though probably a lot of it is. The connectivity evidence you have. The Southwest Regional Development Agency did more work on the question of peripherality and its economic impact than any other RDA I've researched and I did a lot of work on this uh, for the Northern Way when it was running for five years. There are declining levels of productivity the further west you go along the southwest peninsula. It's just extraordinary. I haven't brought the graph along. But crudely, if you take the whole of the southwest, which you know, starts in Swindon and ends in the Scilly Isles, it's 33% below London. And I don't feel particularly gloomy about that. You can pick most of the remoter regions of England, you'll find the same thing. Why? Well, the analysis done for um, Swerda basically concluded, well, there are some structural differences, but in the end, you can't explain this difference in productivity except by reference to connectivity. It makes a difference. And they were very clear that um, anything beyond two hours from London, basically you will see it's much harder for new businesses to form. It just is. Um, I'll give you an example. Admiral Insurance, which is now the biggest employer in Wales. Think of the rugby matches and what they wear on the shirts. They set up in Cardiff because it was a place that, when they set up their business 20 years ago now, they judged to be within two hours of London. They had a plan. It was set up by about 10 people, a couple of whom were American. They said, we're going to grow a global business out of this. We like the UK. We'll set it up in Britain. Where should we go? Don't know, need to be two hours from London. That's our limit. They decided Cardiff would do. And if you think about where's really prospering in the southwest, where do you see new investment in industrial centres and so on? I'd say, it's a tough message in Plymouth, I'd say Exeter, I'd say Plymouth. I mean, Plymouth's prospering uh, in some ways. But you know, if you were two hours from London, I tell you the position would be very, very different. And all the evidence suggests that. So I reckon you've got to get as close to two hours as possible. I think you've got to speed up the journeys. I think you should be looking for direct services to Heathrow. That's not on the plan. There's a connection, but it's going to directly connect great places like Slough to Heathrow. Well, why isn't there a direct service from the west of England? Why not? Um, New stations, not Summerford, Somerton, sorry about that. I mean, th all these things are worth supporting. They will all add to the case because they'll add, add to the demand and rail freight. So practical next steps. I would say move on from a task force, which has done great stuff, and start looking at a statutory transport authority. You've done the right thing in persuading your authorities. I mean, you're all different. <laughs> to work together. If you don't, you haven't got a hope in hell. Form a regional transport body. I would look for a West of England franchise. I'd get on and start looking at the business case. Seriously, I know some work's been done, to invest and I'd promote direct Heathrow services. So, in the first part, I tried to convince you and I didn't see anybody nodding, so I probably failed. The HS2 itself, which is in another part of the country, is actually not a bad thing for the southwest at all. Uh, I do think there's an interesting proposition to reopen the Tavistock Oakhampton line. I think the devolution bill, third point, opens up this new opportunity. And I think there's a lot to be said for local management of franchises. Yeah. 
A franchise that's managed from Plymouth or Exeter or Cornwall. And I do believe the South West would really benefit from better connectivity. I mean, it's no, I mean, I haven't talked at all about how you achieve this, but it's not impossible, but you'll have to fight for it. So with that, I'll finish. Thank you. <laughs>